Q, what do we got going? What's the first question? So our first question today, Ed, is given your experience, what are the top three qualities a startup founder should look for in their first hires? And why are these especially important in the early stages? First hires. Let's break this down into two sections, Tony, because I know you yeah. got a lot of opinions on it. Let's talk about co-founder and let's talk about hires. And I'd love to hear your opinion. I went on a huge rant yesterday <laughs> during yesterday's shows about co-founders, but I'd love to hear yeah. your take on co-founders first and then let's get to employees. Yeah. I don't want to regurgitate too much of, you know, what you mentioned yesterday about co-founders, but I think the number one piece of advice I always give people is that, are you sure that you need a co-founder right away? Because I think that there is this you know, misconception that when we're chasing funding, that we need to have a co-founder to enable to like achieve that. And sometimes that's the case. Sometimes it's not, but it's not a one size fit all. And I think particularly when your original founder is non-technical, that there is this real big urge to look for like a CTO type capacity. Right. And so, you know, what I always say is that outside of your marriage, your co-founder is probably going to be one of the most important relationships you're ever going to have in your adult life. And so it's something that you really need to take carefully, right? And so thinking about it from that perspective, right? When you date somebody and then you get engaged, right? It's months, maybe even a couple of years before you decide, okay, I'm going to commit to this person. And yet we jump into bed with co-founders like, you know, it's because they're available, right? It's like, oh, they've got the qualifications. It seems like a good fit. Let's just jump right into bed together, right? I've made that mistake before where like I've had some really great co-founders and I've had some where I'm like, I really regretted my choices here. And so, you know, what I always say is find ways to work with co-founders in limited capacities. So that way, you know, you can try it both ways because I think it's really important that your co-founder should enjoy working with you as well. And if it's not a mutually beneficial relationship, he or she's not going to be in, like, you know, they're not going to be wanting involved and go all in with you. And so it's just what you don't want to create is a dynamic where you're pulling all the weight and your co-founder's not because they're just not into it because they're not feeling the relationship, but you've already given up equity. You've already pot committed. So you're kind of stuck together, right? So I always say, it's like, hey, look, try it out in a project basis and say like, hey, I've got certain milestones that we're trying to hit here. Love to bring you on to see how we work together. From there, based on the results of there, you can scale into maybe some sort of contract basis, you know, where like, hey, I'll pay you for this next year. And then slowly but surely, once you both feel comfortable, you can move into like an equity type situation where you're both going all in. But I always tell people is, A, don't feel the urge that you have to have a co-founder right away. And B, if you do decide that's the direction you want to go, make sure you just don't rush into it. You know, get opinions on people, try multiple people out, right? You know, just don't rush it too much. I just want to make a note. We are not condoning that you physically jump in bed with your co-founders. If I did that, that's the <laughs> fastest way to drive co-founders away. But yeah. figuratively <laughs> speaking, Tony's definitely got the right point. And as always, you can listen to my other clips about this. Cliff's investing schedules are an absolute must when you're working with co-founders. Yeah. And then when you're together, co-founder agreements, operating agreements, depending on how your company is structured, because that is all going to come up in the due diligence. Don't take it for granted. It all comes up. You got skeletons in the closet when it comes to your co-founders, how it got structured. That is all going to come up. Now let's talk, Tony, about yeah. hiring. So let, let me just set the play for you, okay? You've got maybe a couple co-founders and they're working and then bang, first round of funding comes in or they made enough money and they wanna hire employee number one. What is your advice? Yeah, first piece of advice I tell people, and this sounds counterintuitive to somebody who is in the recruitment industry, but I try to talk them out of it at first. And here's why. So many times when you're at early stage and that first wave of funding comes in, you think, okay, I need to scale up headcount to meet capacity, to meet demand. Challenge you often see is processes and tools aren't often in place to support that kind of growth and scale. So what I always try to advise is like, let's look under the hood of whatever role you're trying to fill and make sure, have you automated via AI, via tools, via processes, all that you can do? And basically you're at the function and saying, we can't take this any further without bringing somebody else on. That's number one, right? Because again, we think, I've seen it happen time and time again, where we think we're gonna bring on an engineer, we're gonna bring on a head of sales because we're gonna transition from founder-led sales into our first account executive or VP of sales. Problem is, if those processes aren't in place, I mean, you're just gonna burn that capital so fast and you will lose the confidence of your investors, right? 
So I would say that's piece number one. Piece number two is really, you want to make sure as founders, like we wear a lot of hats, especially in the early stages, is get really good at being good at HR, right? So a lot of things that we don't think about in the beginning are, okay, we're hiring up. What do agreements look like? What do policies and handbooks and, and you know support looks like? Because now you're exposing yourself to liabilities that maybe before when you're working out of your basement and didn't matter, who cares? But now you've got people who are working for you. So that opens you up to a lot of like laws and policies and procedures. And those are landmines that people don't realize, right? And so again, you want to immerse yourself in, you know, being good at HR. And yeah, there's a lot of great fractional, you know, uh, services or people who can take on those functions for you. But you as a founder should make sure that you at least have a good base knowledge. Because one thing that always happens is whether it's HR or it's technology or it's sales component, we blindly trust these hires to run this part of the business. I've hired them. I'm going to focus on other things. And then six weeks later, you check in and you find out the bottom just dropped out. You're like, well, I just assumed that they were doing it. And so you really have to make sure, as they always say, the old saying is, you know, inspect what you expect and basically making sure that you're constantly doing check-ins with the idea of you have some level of expertise of what you expected. That's so important. Let me just pause you right there because I think yeah. what happens, Tony, is people bring on especially new hires and they lack that experience in HR, not just HR, but also management. They lack yeah. that experience. And what happens is they expect a hire to be just as engaged, just as motivated as you are as a co-founder. And you expect that and then you don't inspect what you expect because you're expecting them to just act like a co-founder and all the systems yeah. aren't there. And people just get frustrated. They say, man, this is just a big waste of money. And then you feel bad. And you don't want to let them go, which brings in the higher, slow, fire, quick aspect of it. And a lot of that can come down to the co-founder not being able to manage the employee. There's so many factors that come into this place when it comes to just a co-founder getting out of their own head and getting good at HR and getting away from that expectation that everybody's going to act like you. Stay up as long as you do. Be just as engaged. An employee is not incentivized the same way that you are as a co-founder. You know, and I think those are great points. And, you know, two other points I would bring up is one, there's a big difference I often see between a first-time founder and a second-time founder. And really that comes into expectations and aligning those expectations and along the lines of what you're talking about, you know, we're thinking, okay, this employee one is going to work 60 hours a week and they're going to, you know, they're going to bleed everything in regards to this business. And they might, but they also might say, you know, I've got a family and outside interest. I'm going to put in all my work, but I can't be working Friday night at 10 o'clock. Other big thing is making sure that you're aligning what you're offering to what you expect. I often see really, really low pay bands really, really low equity, you know, grant with the expectation of this person's going to be killing themselves, right? So you just have to make sure that, you know, you get good advice from people in the industry of what is a, you know, fair compensation package to bring on, you know, those first couple of employees, right? And so we always say, you know, you have that employee pool of your equity shares put aside to make sure that you're attracting top talent. Because the other thing I was going to mention in my second point is, we live in an era, and I see this all the time these days, people need work so bad that during the interview process, they will say and do whatever it takes to get their foot in the door, <laughs> right? So if they told you they, they part of the job was turning water into wine, they would say, yep, I've done it, right? So you just really have to do good due diligence and making sure, is this going to be the right fit? You know, And you know, to Q's question that she asked earlier is, right? You can find somebody on paper that would have the core skill sets, right? Whether it's a developer or a salesperson on paper, they've done this or that, but working in an early stage startup versus working at Google, two completely different beasts. And they're not for everyone. They're different. One's not better than the other, but you have to make sure that somebody does have the right mentality to work in a startup, right? And that is being creative, being nimble, being okay with wearing multiple different hats, all the things that we talk about all the time are, you know, around the, you know, startups.com. So doing a better job of making sure that those intrinsic soft skills are going to align up with the mission of what you're trying to do.